right. Uh, I believe we're live now. So just wanted to say hi to everyone uh, streaming in to this session uh, with Jeff Patton, where we're going to be talking about five common mistakes that team makes um, that teams make when user story mapping. So I'm just going to give people, you know, a couple of minutes here to uh, join the session. If you're joining, just you know, go ahead and say hi. Feel free to drop a note in the chat about where you're from. And we we're, I know we just started. All right, perfect. I see the chat's coming in. Hi, Veronica. Uh, thanks, thanks for dropping a note in here. Uh, for uh, you know, those of you who don't know me, my name is Shipra Kayan. I'm the product evangelist here at Miro. Uh, I usually am hosting distributed, but this time around, uh, I'm here to bring you a session with Jeff uh, Patton this, uh, this year. Jeff is really synonymous with user story mapping, although he spent sort of decades building products uh, out there. Um, and then uh, he wrote this book on how story mapping uh, and story maps are the new backlog. Uh, it's been really instrumental in my personal career in design. Um, I feel like I'm like a prolific story mapper. It's like the answer to all, all problems and every project. So I'm really excited to have Jeff here with us um, with to just share with the Miro community's uh, informal casual chat, to share with the Miro community what's happened since he wrote story the book, right? Like teams have been trying to leverage it. What are some mistakes that common mistakes that he's seen teams make? So we'll we'll get into that. Um, meanwhile, if you all are here, just know that just you you can uh, drop in messages in the chat as well as questions in uh, in the questions box. So like just we'll we'll look at the chat, we'll keep an eye on the chat, look at the questions and make sure we we try and uh, address them as we go here. All right, I see a full house here, Jeff. So we'll uh, we'll kick it off. Um, I would say most of Miro, the Miro community attending distributed, they know, probably know what user story mapping is, but for those who don't, uh, maybe you could start um, start by sharing sort of what is a user story map. Yeah. Chipper, you can see the you can see see the Miro board that I'm sure. Yes, getting through. Yeah. All right, it's Thank coming for being here. Look, uh, normally if anybody's seen me teach before, I hand draw everything that I teach, and I didn't have a lot of time to hand draw things. We don't have a lot of time together, so I did all my hand drawings this morning and pasted them in and <laughs> made you nervous but that's because i didn't have them there before today uh, look uh there's just a panel that explains a little bit about what a story map is and for people that don't know i mean uh, uh i started using this type of mapping to support agile development for people that are already designers or ux people you know that a story map is just a journey map or an experience map it just describes the, the experience of somebody using a product. But one of the things I learned very early on in agile development is uh, I can think outside in, or I can think about a user's journey through a product and then start to decompose that into the work that we have to do to build the product. So that's it. Basically, Story Mac just tells a story about people using a product, left to right, top to bottom. We start to decompose user steps into smaller steps. And at a certain point, those smaller steps become nice, tidy backlog items. And then that simple square shapes, easy for people to use. And if you can see that picture there, the, the bottom picture, we use the, the vertical axis to slice up maps, to slice them into smaller, small successful releases. Uh, look on this panel. Panel. There's uh, there's just a very short description of what story mapping is. There's a, a link to the Miro template for story mapping. There's a link to my book if you don't already have it. There's a link to the first, well, one of the first articles I wrote out there that explains what it is, a quick reference guide. And if you do want to take a class, I teach uh, product management, product ownership classes, and people will build a story, uh, different variations of maps almost every day in that class. Uh, Amazing. Uh, Shipra, we were talking yeah. about what are common mistakes so look i tried to oh i didn't mean to do that hold on a second let's see sorry i'm uh i'm bumbly when it comes to uh, uh oh. no you're good uh and actually i was just gonna tell the audience that we'll share this mirror board out and the yeah. links to these resources uh including the templates and uh jeff's book 
Um, but if I can, if I could share, Jeff, my perspective on what a story map is, I think of a journey map sometimes as, you know, like from discovery and research as the user's version of yeah. the world. And a story map kind of is like a product's perspective of how the user flows through the product. I, um, Yes. So when I think of a journey map, you usually think of the user's version of the world without the product mm -hmm. or before the product is there or as is. The the world is. As I'll definitely, definitely I'll annotate a journey map uh, with where the pains are and the problems are and how long things you know take to do things like that. But uh, that's what, what we do. If, you know, if you're a product manager, a characteristic of software as a product is software products continuously change and improve. We're continuously looking at people's experience today in our products, finding where the pains are, and a map works great for that. Uh, and then wherever there's pain, you say, okay, what can I do to, to alleviate that? So a lot of people, we use story maps primarily on the solution side. I have to imagine what people will do step-by-step step in the product, the, the products that, that's not there yet. So I uh, love that. it's an imagining the future kind of exercise. That, I Love it. Journey map shows the problem. Story maps are the solution. So let's no. dig into yeah. what, yeah, what some of the uh, some of the problems you're seeing. Because I know every time I start building a story map, there's so many moments that I get stuck or I pause or you know just you know. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I, I, mean, I expect your problems are the problems that I see commonly. So if I go through this. First one I put in here, the first one thing I stumble into when I'm working with people building story maps is they don't actually map stories or they lose the story. Uh, the most common variation of thing I, things I see that people refer to as a story map are where they identify features in the product and then uh, left to right, they'll put they'll, they'll prioritize features, most important feature first, uh, least important feature to the right, and then they'll decompose the feature into components or parts of features, things they have to build. And that works well for building a backlog. It just doesn't tell a story it reveals a plan. And so uh, uh, there's a short description of this here, but I'll just remind people that, look, if you've got a feature, you use a story map to tell the story about the feature. Just identify uh, the, who's using that feature and from beginning to end, tell the story step by step by step, uh, get across, uh, tell the whole story first, and then start to decompose each step into smaller steps and break it down helps, uh, should have drawn this here, it helps here to also start to visualize what it looks like, visualize what screens look like, things like that. So, oh, interesting. So would you like just drop in like screenshots from any prototypes or wireframes oh, yeah, in yeah. here? Yeah, it usually titles across the top. And as soon as people can see what a screen looks like, uh, if you're working with engineers on a team, they can start to uh, de participate in decomposing that or identifying what's going on in those screens. I can usually walk up to a map and if all if everything written on the sticky notes are nouns, uh, names of features or names of components or names of things on screens, I know that's probably not a story map. What I'm looking for are short verb phrases, are steps, are things that people do. Uh, you may know that when I teach story mapping, I'll ask people to I'll, uh, ask people to map their morning routine. And I'll point out to them that they, they wrote down brush teeth. They didn't write, write down toothbrush and toothpaste. Uh, uh, those, those are the things. Those are the features. Those aren't the steps. Right, yeah. right. So, yeah, the first one, first problem I see most commonly is people aren't actually telling a story with the map. But the, the, the second thing I see is you're, we're using these maps for decomposition and people start telling a story, but then they just drop down into super granular details, get lost in the details. Uh, whenever I see a story map that starts with login or uh, has things that say click a particular button, I know they're down in the weeds or way down. Uh, the, the biggest thing that I didn't point out in the story mapping book that I use commonly is I make sure that people tell me, okay, who's in the story, identify people, and mm -hmm. identify the beginning and the end of the story, and just get to the end of the story, stay high level, stay mile wide, inch deep, get to the end of the story, and then start decomposing. Don't get lost in the weeds or lost in the details and never get to the end of the story. So I see people getting lost really quickly with those things. This is um, this is really interesting to me because it's really about like yeah having the full full picture, but then also maybe and tell me if you see this, but perhaps it's also about choosing the right level of the right beginning and the right end. So they can't be too big. Maybe like you need like a medium sized mm -hmm. part of the story, 
um, because sometimes I see teams like trying to map their entire entire product uh, in one map. Well, that's funny. Because, okay, oh. so let me go to number four. Let me go to number four. Okay. <laughs> because uh, saying, yeah. come back to three because that's what that's what I see. Is I see people they've already got an existing product and they want right. to just add an additional feature capability to the product. And for some reason, they feel like they have to tell the whole product story beginning to end. They have to talk about what people already do in the product all the way from the beginning to the end. And then it was sometimes it's nice to have that whole product map. And then when you're adding a feature, you can see that that feature injects a few extra steps for one person upstream and another person downstream. But don't do that. Uh, it's So again, my number four is mapping the whole product when you're just trying to add a single feature. Uh, 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 oh, shoot, I got to correct my language, add a single features <laughs> when you're just trying to add mm -hmm. features. Sorry, I pasted this in fast this morning. Uh, 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 so yeah, that, I see that people going way too broad, uh, and they don't start the the beginning and the end of their map at the beginning, the end of using the feature. They start it at the beginning and the end of using the whole product, and uh, and then kind of bury the lead or bury the feature inside there. Totally, and I think actually this is really like I don't want to lose this uh, important point. I find that choosing the right level for mapping your story is important. And I like this feature sort of feature level um, or maybe epic, but like, mm -hmm. don't try and go beyond that. Hey, uh, that's a bigger discussion sometimes, but- uh, Oh, I'll, I'll you use, don't I'll, agree. Yeah, no, 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 I do, I'll just, uh, all that epic means is it's too big to put in the current sprint. So uh, it, <sighs> everything's, uh, everything's an epic until it's not. And an epic doesn't mean it's not a story. It just means it's big, that's all. <sighs> Uh, yeah, things start as really, really big. And oh, the, the metaphor from the story mapping book I use is uh, the rock smashing metaphor. In fact, there's another book kind of built around that metaphor. I didn't, uh, that I just came out recently. But uh, look, if you've got a big uh, rock and you put it in the table, uh, in the middle of the table and hit it with a sledgehammer and it breaks into a whole bunch of pieces, all those pieces are still rocks. Same thing with a story. You put a big story out there, you break it into small pieces, all those pieces are still stories. Now, the stories we want to bring in to the team to do development with are, are pretty small. Uh, and a, a map can help you get down to small, but you get down to small by telling the story. Now, the, the Shipper, the other thing I didn't point it out here, but it's in the quick reference is um, use the concept of goal level that comes from a guy named Alistair Coburn, where, uh, where we look at uh, steps that people take from a Goal, a goal level perspective of functional level or C level using goal level is something you would start doing with the intention of finishing it before you do something else. Uh, like mm. again, when I teach people a story map and they write down, take a shower, I'll explain, well, taking a shower is functional level because you don't start taking a shower and then say, wow, this is really getting boring. I'm going to go grab a cup of coffee and I'll finish my shower later. Yeah, right. That's the way it works. Uh, you, you start with the intention of finishing it. So yeah, maps have a goal level that can be really high goal level uh, or they can, uh, but one of the things that happens sometimes is people drop way down into the weeds uh, uh, in, into the details. You, you'll need to get to the details eventually, but not before you get that whole story out. Got it. Got it. Okay. This is, uh, the, these are like some good metaphors to keep in mind. I have a question that's kind of relevant. So I'm going to sneak it in here and then we yeah, can go please. to uh, the problem number three. But uh, do you uh, have like a certain number of releases that you think teams should map out? Or like, how do you think? Because, uh, you know, we map it out and then we do have the debate and negotiation of what we want to do in MVP. How, like, do, how do you think about what, what's your suggestion to teams as they're thinking about like, how deep do I go? Yeah, um, uh, that's number five. Let's do number five. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of, because I've got the pictures there. Um, three <laughs> or, or two plus one, two plus one extra. Uh, for okay. one thing to know when it comes to how deep, and then I'll explain what's going, what I'm trying to show in those pictures and what I'm showing in that text. You know, the minute you release something and people start, start to use it, whatever you thought was going to be in the next yeah. release will change because yes. of what you see happen when people use it. 
So yeah, you're doing your best to try and predict what people will do with what you ship. But the minute you start to see outcomes, the minute you see people do things, what's in the second release changes. So you know, don't map out three and four and five releases. But what I uh, what I'm talking about in this, and this may be tougher to communicate in a, in a few paragraphs, is the common thing I see people doing with story mappings is uh, filling each release to capacity saying, okay, yeah. we've got a release, how much can we get in it and making trade-offs about what goes into that release? Uh, and the, a lot of arguing about what feature belongs and what release. What I'm trying to say here is don't. Uh, one of the things, uh, it's the, oh, I've got to write a, a second edition of the story mapping book. I'm sharper with the way I teach this these, these days. But when I talk about a release strategy, strategy, a strategy is what you use to make decisions about what goes into a release. So I organize release strategies around a target outcome. By a target outcome, I mean who does what differently. So I can say if the first release release is primarily for this person or this class of people, and they can do this, they do this differently, they uh, achieve this, and uh, maybe for a secondary class of people, and it affects them a little bit. Then, uh, given that, then I can make decisions about what goes into each release. Yeah. What is the yeah. least I can put in the release to allow these people I'm focusing on to accomplish what they need to accomplish or uh, to improve things, to become more efficient or more effective or use uh, our product to do something that they were doing in, uh, outside our product before. I will anchor a release on target outcomes, target audience, and uh, and what their actions are that are different. And I can build a release strategy that goes three, four, five releases deep, but the strategy isn't the choices I made for the features. The strategy is my choice of where I'm going to focus my release uh, on what people first. Um, uh, yeah, well, I'm trying to think of easy metaphors to describe this, but uh, this, this is the way we grow a product in the market. I remember I worked with the company, I worked with Spotify, Spotify as a company when they were tiny, when they were a couple hundred people, and when their product was, the only way to log into Spotify was through Facebook, and the only way to find new music uh, was by looking to see what your friends were listening to. So uh, the target audience uh, for uh, first version of Spotify were people using Facebook that had friends. If you didn't use Facebook and didn't have friends, uh, it wasn't going to help you as much. <laughs> so uh, you couldn't even log on if you didn't have Facebook. So that's a small target audience to start with. You make a release really smaller by choosing a smaller audience and, and fewer outcomes. Uh, yeah. And then a really, it sounds like, like really kind of attaching yourself to that outcome and to that story whether the outcome is a metric or it's like it could be a qualitative. Sometimes it's, if you're really small, it might be a qualitative outcome. If you're yeah. a bigger company, it might be a metric, but really tying to outcomes uh, versus what is the capacity and what is, uh, yeah, just like trying to fill, yeah. fill, fill the bucket. Yeah, my, yeah, don't, uh, what I see people doing with a story map sometimes is just trying to fill the bucket to capacity and instead of backing up and saying, what's our strategy? Who are we focused on? And uh, I see uh, when people are trying to fill the capacity, you see them creating releases that try to help too many people just a little bit instead of really focusing on helping one person or one group of people a lot. Yeah. So let's go all the way back to my third one, and then we, you and I can talk. And uh, this one's fairly deep. The the other fretting, uh, a lot of te text here. I just realized I need to put a, uh, I'm going to go back and clean up my paragraphs here just a little bit. One of the things that people always fret about is, you know, uh, story maps are flat. Uh, they tell a story. Uh, and this really winds up people a lot. Uh, they'll say that there's branches or conditions here. And uh, uh, people will say, well, uh, you know, we do this step and then somebody has to make a decision. If they make the decision, uh, if they, uh, it, it, it could end up in do them doing this or this. Uh, uh, and if they go the other direction, they could do that or that. Uh, and I'll say, okay, that's great. Uh, no, so I'd, I'd map it like this and I'll just flatten it out. And they say, well, why did you choose to put that branch first versus the other branch? And I'll say, I didn't, you did in the way you told me the story. I, uh, a quirk of the way humans have to speak is we can't speak two sentences at the same time and I'll map it in the order people tell the story. 
uh, sometimes I'll you know go up a level and indicate the this is the first branch or I don't say this is the first branch will indicate what the, the choice that people made and the steps underneath it but I like using the vertical axis to decompose and to prioritize and if we start trying to uh, a story map is not a flow chart a story map really relies on storytelling uh, on humans to back it up to point and gesture and say people do this then this then this and if they make this decision they'll go over here and do this but if they made this other decision they're going to go over here to this branch and do these things that that's it relies on uh, the story maps don't work as a communication device without a human to, to walk you through them. Uh, I think this is so important because it, yeah, people can get really hung up on it. And I love when you said a story map is not a flow chart, right? Like flow charts have their purpose and a story map is just a tool. It's not meant to be like the most accurate representation of like, there are flow. More much more accurate representations uh, the um yeah the story maps really lean on storytelling they really lean on uh it, it, let me explain that second picture uh it's sometimes you see a, a a branch where a user could do one set of things or another set of things or you see another branch where we hand off to two different users and users are, do, are doing things concurrently and so i'll see people get super tempted to stack them on top of each other to, to show that it's happening concurrently and I, you know, I'll live with that. That's okay. Uh, but uh, again, I just flatten it out uh, um, and use, use the storytelling to communicate that. Uh, uh, there's a, the concepts uh, the uh, communicate in the story mapping book is the, the vacation photo effect and, and Shepard, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, no, uh, no, uh, remind uh, me again. <laughs> um, look, if I show, uh, if, if I send you one of my vacation photos, you can look at it and say, well, that looks interesting and that looks fun. But when I see that vacation photo, I remember being there. I remember lots of details. Yeah. I remember what it sounded like, smelled like. I remember everything we were doing before that and what we were doing after that. The vacation photo means a lot to someone who was there. And when you look at one of these maps or one of these pictures, you don't need all the details. By seeing what's in the map, you remember what we talked about and what happened when we were there. The uh, 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 important thing for me, me about stories in agile development and storytelling is we rely an awful lot on the visualization plus the, the talking, the collaboration we did, we rely a lot on that vacation photo effect to communicate that. Yeah. yeah, I think this is, okay, I love, I love that metaphor because it's all of this is meaningless unless you're doing it collaboratively yeah. and the artifact is like, is just a way, means of collaboration, right? It's a, like, it, it's a memento. It, it's, well, it facilitates yeah. the collaboration memento. while you're doing it. And just like a vacation photo after you did it, it helps you remember all the things you talked about. And if somebody wasn't there, somebody who was there can, just like a, if I were to tell you a story about one of my vacation photos, I could show it to you and then tell you the story around it. And then when you see the photo, you'll remember some, some of my story. Uh, uh, that That's... <sighs> That's the way it works. So I mean, like that, they don't rely on precise communication the way a flow chart would or a UML diagram or a use case or, you know, if, if they're if you're trying to communicate a lot of important stuff without being there, you're going to have to use a more uh, yeah, a higher precision form of communication. Totally. And those come before and after a story map, right? The story map is about collaborating, making decisions, aligning, uh, maybe discovering, uh, but not necessarily. I, I mean, one of the questions, or one of the questions I saw in chat was, how do you go from to Jira from here? <laughs> um, and I'm just going to put a plug in for the Miro Jira integration. Yeah, if you're yeah, using Miro, cool. you can just yeah. like select all of these yellow stories yeah. and send them to Jira. Exactly. You use a uh, Miro to say, uh, to collaborate, build shared understanding. And then if you decide, okay, this is our first release slice, select those things, put them into Jira. And what happens in Jira is they turn into a flat backlog uh, and you can then prioritize them as work and do the work, but there's still a connection between the Miro board and Jira. So you can see what work has been started and finished and, uh, and things like that. Yeah. And personally, for me, when I do this with my teams, I love seeing uh, just getting a visual, 
I like I'm a designer. I'm not a fan of Jira, but sometimes I can see a visual of which parts of the story are green and done and which parts yeah. are still to be done. So I know what to expect in the experience. So you don't, I, yeah. you don't use Jira to communicate uh, or tell the story. Uh, you use Jira to prioritize and organize work. Uh, Jira is a ticketing tool. It's a planning tool. Uh, uh, it is not a storytelling tool. And uh, I've worked with Atlassian on and off over the years, and Atlassian is really good at using Jira for planning and using other tools for telling stories and telling their product story. They're not relying on Jira for that. All right. Uh, so I know we are technically on time, but because we have Jeff <laughs> okay. here, I have like one, I see one more really interesting question. Okay. There's so many questions. Honestly, you guys in the chat will try and try and like get to uh, get to some of these. But um, the, the do question another? that I, <laughs> I know we should do, we should do a follow up Q&A. Um, the question that I thought was really interesting was how, what do you, do you have a perspective on jobs to be done? And does that does that kind of okay. work with story mapping? So in the context of teaching, I, I, uh, I'll i go back to original Clayton Christensen videos and explain jobs mm -hmm. to be done. And I suffer from learning uh, interaction design from guys like Alan Cooper and uh, the founder of Personas, things like that, or the person who popularized using Personas. And what Christensen means by a job to be done and what Alan Cooper meant by a goal honestly is the same thing. It's, it's our why. It's why we use the product. And yes, I like jobs to be done, uh, but uh, it's a, a way of working with things that came from one community and traditional interaction design came from another community. And I know that jobs to be done folks will show examples of personas and why they're not good, but usually they show examples of bad personas. Uh, and, uh, and yes, bad personas aren't good for, for uh, traditional design or for jobs to be done. I like jobs to be done thinking, uh, 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 but I see a, a lot of overlap in it. And But also I have to uh, claim a little bit of ignorance. Uh, I understand the basics of jobs to be done and where the, the origin comes from. There's a few models that come from jobs to be done I like, like the forces diagram is one I'll yeah. use in, in thinking yes. through things. Uh, 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 but uh, it, uh, I don't know if jobs to be done has something like a journey map or a story map as a, as a, as a model built into it. So I, I, the, yeah. the mindset is great, but I uh, uh, come get a hold of me later and I'll tangle with you, but it's not new. It's not different. It's, uh, it's, it's good language for talking about uh, uh, something we all, uh, we all should understand. Totally. And essentially, and the forces diagram is my favorite too, but essentially all of these frameworks talk about, you know, what is the user, what is the user goal? And I think in a story map, also you have the space for your target user. What are, you know, what are they trying to achieve? And then how is your solution helping them achieve it? So it's kind of, we're all trying to say the same things with different at, vocabulary. At risk of going too far along, uh, a story map makes you think in outcomes. I'll, I'll precisely define an outcome as what your users do. Uh, do and how they feel and what they say after that. If you're building a story map right, it makes you think through what users will then do with your product. And if every sticky note you put down is a short verb phrase, every one of them are uh, those are things that could be instrumented in your product and measured whether they actually do those things. Uh, a story map forces you to think in outcomes. Uh, and I'll see jobs to be done is really good at pointing out people's goals, but at some point we need to figure out what they do differently. And we need to be able to tell a story about what they do differently. And then we need to build a product that supports them doing that. Uh, oh, that. Force you uh, to envision what they do. Right. Sounds like we're going to close out the stream. This was too short, but Jeff, thanks for coming. And then yeah. we'll, we'll share out links as well as I think anyone that's trying to move into product thinking from project management, like you all need to take Jeff's course. Thanks, Jeff, for hanging with us. Thanks much.